Well, good afternoon. My name is Tarna Hunter, and I'm with the Department of Employee Trust Funds. We're really excited today that you're joining us for this webinar, Wisconsin Strong Women, Financial Steps for Family Caregivers. Today, we have Judith Kozlowski with us. This uh, webinar is being recorded, and if you have questions, please feel welcome to put them in the questions box, and they will be addressed at the end of this presentation. So a little bit about Judith. Judith Kozlowski is a senior fellow at the Women's Institute for a Secure Retirement. She is also a subject matter expert with the Department of Justice Elder Justice Initiative. Prior to her current role, Ms. Kozlowski was a senior advisor to the Health and Human Services Assistant Secretary for Aging and the Administration of Community Living, where she worked on national policy initiatives concerning elder abuse and financial exploitation. She also had a long career as a state and federal prosecutor in New York, Miami, Washington, D.C., where she focused on the investigation and trial of complex fraud and white-collar cases as an assistant United States attorney. She created and ran a multidisciplinary elder financial exploitation federal prosecution team for over a decade. She was also a trial counsel and branch chief at the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission and the director of the Criminal, Criminal Prosecution Assistance Group at the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. Ms. Kozlowski also helped establish the Office for the Financial Protection of Older Americans and at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. She regularly speaks at local and national conferences on elder justice, particularly on elder financial exploitation. As a wiser senior fellow, she also speaks on the topic of caregiving and other issues impacting women's financial security. We are really lucky today to have Judith join us and give us some steps on family caregiving. Thank you so much. I'm gonna hand it over to Judith right now. Oh, thank you, Tarna, for such a nice uh, introduction. I can't tell you how excited I am to do this because this is, um, of all the different presentations I do, this is one of my absolute favorites. It is because I think it's really important for every family to know the information. And every time I go through this, I think of the mistakes that I've made in my own life about family caregiving and the things, that, the information that I want to pass on to others. So I hope you find this useful today. I hope that you also, uh, at the end, I'll show you where you can download the uh, entire booklet of what my slides represent today, along with worksheets that you can use from the WISER website. And uh, I also would urge you to sign up for the WISER newsletter, which will continue to give updates and more information about uh, the issues uh, surrounding women's uh, financial security across the lifespan. So let's talk now about financial steps for family caregivers. WISER, uh, one of my absolute favorite uh, nonprofits in the United States, also has one of the best acronyms, WISER, WISER Women. And I think we all need to be that. It's a nonprofit organization founded 25 years ago to provide women with basic financial information and helping them to take control of their lives their financial life. This is to help educators and policymakers who do a lot of work on the Hill with the variety of uh, committees, including the Senate Special Commission on Aging, the Senate uh, Finance Committees, the Banking Committees, and any other committee, both in the House and Senate, that touches the economic life of any woman. We also work very hard to bring stakeholders together to improve solutions for women in their retirement income outcomes. Also operate the uh, the National Resource Center for Women on Retirement Planning, which was part of the Administration on Aging. Uh, it provides a one-stop shop, if you will, to provide basic retirement information and resources for um, for all people, but we're particularly focused on the issues that the economic issues of women. We are an extremely diverse group. We uh, work primarily with moderate and lower income women, women of color, women with limited. Uh, English speaking proficiency, but I can tell you right now that the information applies to uh, everyone across the uh, economic spectrum and any other spectrum you can think of. So please visit us at wiserwomen.org. Just remember, all of us want to be one of those wiser women. So, what will we cover today? Well, we're going to see about why we focus on women, the financial impact of caregiving, 
the steps you can take as a caregiver and avoiding some common mistakes that caregivers make. And I've made them, believe me. Caregivers are also a defense against financial fraud. And then we'll give you a list of resources and tools that you can use as you work this out in your own life. So why are we looking at women? Because there are 5.8 more women, million more women than men as we age. And at 67% of the women, of the people over 85 are women. There are more single women now than ever before. And caregivers who are female are twice as likely than non-caregivers to end up in poverty. Don't ignore that statistic because the largest growing population of individuals in the United States over the age of 85 who are living in poverty are women. So what are some of the issues unique to women? Well, we all know over the lifespan, they earn less even if they work full time. They have to take time away from work to take care of someone, a family member, you know, a close or not so close relative, a spouse, a child. They also also resort to part-time work more often than men in order to accommodate this changing schedule that occurs over the lifetime. As a result of all these things, they're less in money in savings and pensions. They end up far more in for bigger percentages living alone during retirement, and they live longer. For example, in my family, most of the women live into their late 90s. My mom lived to 98 and a half, and my father passed away not yet a year ago at two months shy of 100. So when we talk about planning, as we'll talk about a little more, I always plan for 100 because if, if my gene pulls any example, I plan to be living longer. So what do caregivers today look like? Well, as we all know from some of the, the more recent uh, press, caregiving is a really broad definition. It includes personal care, health monitoring, coordination of fat household functions, financial assistance, and social direction. There are 34.2 million Americans who provide unpaid care to a relative or a friend over the age of 50. I was one of those people. I cared for my parents for almost a decade while I worked full time. I also averaged about 30 hours a week in caregiving for my parents. I'm an only child. I'm married and have two children. So I was balancing everything you can imagine. Also important for us to know is between 2020 and 2060, the number of older adults is projected to increase by 60%. From 56 million to 94, almost 95 million, with most people needing at least three years of care, but one in five, 20% needing over five years of care. The caregiving crunch is coming and we need to, pretend, we need to uh, prepare for that. As we all know too, uh, women are the primary caregivers. Most of the caregiving falls to women and 61% of women are caregivers. They're often younger than their spouses and often outlive their spouses, falling, having that responsibility fall to them along with other perhaps familial responsibilities. The majority of caregiving women give little or no thought to their own financial situation. I plead guilty to that. And yet over half of them describe their financial situation as poor. All 20%, nearly one in five, say their financial situation has worsened over the time that they have been caregivers. Male caregivers report that an estimated, they have an estimated medium, uh, median of $130,000 in retirement savings, where women have a median of $19,000. And 20% of the women who are caregivers have no retirement savings at all. Also, women are three times as likely as men to retire earlier in order to anticipate all these other needs that are, are thrust upon them during the time, you know, part of a lifetime. And caregivers report feeling, women particularly, feeling overwhelmed almost twice as often as men. That could be a stoicism that men uh, like to project or not, but nonetheless, women report that feeling of overwhelmed much more, um, twice as much as men. 
So let's just take a look at what are some of the financial consequences of caregiving. I always put this in terms of things we should think about before we jump with our heart. Think a little bit with our head. Taking on caregiving responsibilities is a lot. It also is a lot, not only for emotional and psychological reasons, but also for financial reasons. And you need to take a look at what this uh, commitment that you're about to make is going to have on your financial well being. It impacts in large measure your ability to work. What are the ways you're going to work and how are you going to work and how are you going to be able to balance this new responsibility? And also, here are some of the direct financial impacts that people have reported. Almost 30% cut back on their own expenses. 19% had trouble paying their bills. 22% used up all of their short-term savings. Almost 30%, 28% stopped contributing to their own savings and 23% took on debt. This is an extraordinary picture when you think about it. Even though these percentages may look low, they have a gigantic impact on your financial life, especially as you move forward. So are you a caregiver? Well, maybe not at the moment, but there's a very good chance that you will be at some point in your life. And becoming a caregiver for parents can happen at any time, and that usually comes when you're nearing retirement. And even if you feel financially prepared for your own retirement, you may suddenly find yourself unprepared to manage the costs of caregiving. That's cost in time and also cost a monetary cost. So take steps now to avoid compromising your own financial security. I cannot tell you the number of people I have spoken to at various conferences over time who said that either they or an employee of theirs had the uh, left to become a caregiver, decimated their own financial life and had to come back to work at an age when that wasn't always, the types of jobs were not always so available. So let's get started. Let's get started and develop a family strategy for caregiving teams. Let's go. All right, families need to get involved in this issue early and they need to work with seniors to understand their finances as well as the availability and costs of the services to support that and what they have in their communities. You need to talk with your siblings or other family members about actual costs. What does it cost to hire services? What are the home modifications that may have to take place? And what are the day-to-day -day expenses you might expect to have? Does a geriatric coordinator make any sense? Well, I can tell you in my case, because I've worked in aging for a long time, one of the first things I did, I moved my parents in their mid-90s to live near me because they were uh, 1,500 miles away. So I moved them closer to me in their mid-90s, and I got a geriatric coordinator to help me figure out exactly what were the best of the local resources available to me to be able to uh, you know, uh, work through this next phase of their life. Uh, I can't say enough good things about geriatric coordinators or geriatric social workers. They know what they're doing and they know their communities. So this helps you also to find, figure out the trajectories of a health condition or future costs that might be associated with the older adult you are caring for. Also, no small thing in, in families, small or large, if you are going to be the caregiver or you're going to do most of the care, speak up, talk to her to let them know what you need. These are critical. Make sure if you are working within a family structure at all, that you have been able to assemble the most important legal documents. These are critical. I can't tell you how important these documents are. You want to have a financial power of attorney. You want to have a health care proxy for that, uh, for that older adult. You want to have a living will if that's what you use in your state. It's going to be different. I forgot, I'm sorry, I forgot to look up what the state of Wisconsin does, but sometimes it's called a, a post. A, a, they are the wishes of an older adult at, in, at the time of uh, any possible terminal illness. You want to have that information available, and you also want to have a last will and testament. I have been in a position where I've had to use my financial power of attorney for both of my parents at different times. 
the healthcare proxy I needed with my mother had to have a particular uh, procedure done in the hospital. And uh, it was pretty scary for me, but I had the healthcare proxy and had to make a decision. Uh, and certainly the wills and the last wills and testaments are critical because you may find yourself having to file with the probate court or for some letters of uh, administration of a person's will. So these are all critical. And also continue to check the beneficiary designations for insurance and retirement plans and IRAs. Make sure that you or your family knows who the beneficiaries are of the of various uh, financial instruments so that there's no uh, quibbling a, a, a later uh, about what somebody promised you or didn't promise you or somebody else in the family. Also, know where the documents are located. Those are really key because at some point, if when you do have to uh, actually go through the probate process, you will need every single one of these documents in addition to certified copies of death certificates in order to move forward to, uh, to probate the estate. So these are really key documents. So as you're putting those together though, don't forget about your own future. Make sure you can continue to save for your own retirement. And what are the other resources that you can assist in helping you uh, with the person that you're caring for? Don't forget, and this often happens, who is going to take care of you in later life? Don't forget to put that on your list of things to think about because it's really important for you to know that and also to line up your documents accordingly. Very important to know how you are also going to carry the healthcare uh, co costs, which are extraordinary, especially as you get to the last two or three years of life. Th take a look at longtermcare.gov to look at what long-term care needs are and the cost of long-term care. And, and GenWorth is also the other excellent place to look for the cost of, of long-term care and also to look at the, the possibilities of that and under their uh, tab of aging in you. So if you leave your job, as most many caregivers do, and you're also raising children, 60% of the caregivers work full or part-time. Women average, this is an astounding number to me, nine years out of the workforce to provide care for their families. That's a lot of time, a lot of lost income, and a lot of lost retirement savings uh, for you if you aren't thinking through exactly how this is going to work for you from a financial standpoint. 14% of the working caregivers have taken leaves of absence and 61 have to make schedule adjustments. I have done uh, the latter, mostly making schedule adjustments, but I can tell you that means getting up at four o'clock in the morning to get my work done sometimes. On the average, caregivers spend four and a half years providing for care about 12 hours a week. And I just think you have to you know, figure in one or a day and a half each week and caregiving that would be time that you would devote to this job. So if you continue and you leave too early, you're going to leave uh, less from Social Security. Uh, the benefits are based on your annual pay up to a particular limit, and you need to earn $5,800 a year to have an eligible year. Social Security uses your highest 35 years of pay to calculate your benefits. So. Uh, zeros are added for fewer than 35 years that you work. I can't say this enough. Please exhaust every other option you can possibly think of before you leave a job or reduce your hours. If you can figure out a way for family members, talk to your family members about getting more help, find other resources that are available. The elder care locator is a godsend. It is the best uh, place for you to find resources near you, reliable resources that are vetted before they're part of this, and they can help you find all kinds of resources to help you figure out the kinds of needs you have in your particular circumstance. And even staying an extra year at a job, whether it's full or part-time, can make a big difference, certainly in your retirement, and see whether the Family Medical Leave Act is an option for you or some similar program. And always consider your retirement vesting and benefits schedule and try to work at least until you are fully vested and resi resist a million times the urge to cash out any retirements. As I, I have said in other circumstances, just don't buy the boat. Don't do that. Leave the money there. You will need it. 
Take a look at your health care and insurance options. Are there minimum numbers of hours you can work and still be eligible for your employer's insurance? And before you even think about leaving, take a look at the cost of COBRA. Get estimates on what COBRA or other health care coverage might be before you leave or reduce your hours. I had a circumstance for several months where I needed to uh, have COBRA coverage, and it was extraordinarily expensive. Uh, it was the it was the risk of no coverage or, um, you know, costing uh, what was for me a huge percentage of the uh, the income that I had at the time. Make sure you look at that before you leave a healthcare uh, program that would be part of your regular employment and also make a plan for managing your money and continuing to save for retirement. Pay off credit cards and other debts if you have. Saving even a little every single month or every single paycheck makes a huge difference. And create a budget that factors in caregiving costs. Budgeting as a caregiver is probably the most difficult and the most important thing to do at the same time. There's an, an estimate that says about uh, you know $7,200 a year are out-of-pocket costs for caregiving. These are costs that caregivers, and no matter what their income, this is about the average that people spend uh, out of pocket to take care of um, to take care of another person. And half of the caregivers don't track what they spend. I'm guilty to that. And I wish I had done more of that during the time I took care of my parents. And the cost can be much more, especially if dementia or care provided are at a distance. Uh, if it's closer, they're closer to nine thousand dollars. But both of my parents, uh, my mother had a, a vascular dementia and my father had uh, a fluctuating dementia, and both of those provided uh, challenges, which uh, were translated into extra cost for me for either uh, care or our different kinds of supports for them. The average is the caregivers generally lose about three hundred and twenty four thousand dollars in the course over the course of their lifetime in wages, social security benefits, and private pensions. No matter what, that is a lot of money and a lot of money not to have available to you as you age. So there are steps that you can take to avoid compromising your own financial security. The number one thing is to budget. Caregivers often pay for expense or their care receipt without thinking about the long-term consequences of those payments. So a budget is really essential. Even if you are leaving work or reducing your hours in any way, just make sure you continue to budget and decide how you're going to, what adjustments you need to make in your lifestyle or expenses to account for the caregiving costs that you are sure to ensure, to sure to um, have. And the budget can also protect you or prevent your family conflicts if you are managing somebody else's money. That's really key. If you have the, uh, the uh, financial power of attorney and you are exercising that as part of the budgeting process for an older adult, it's really critical to keep good records. They don't have to be fancy records. They can be a small spiral notebook that you carry around with you and scribble in the day and what you bought and how much it costs. And that's all you would need to do to be able to look back the week or month later to see what the, the expenses were. So track your spending. Aha, uh -huh. I didn't even know this was coming. Note all of your expenses for the month. Put purchases into categories. If you can, make a list of regular bills that are, are sure to come up and study the credit card and bank statements to ensure that you account for everything. Also to account for the fact that often older adults' credit cards, if you're using one that belongs to an older adult, are often targeted for fraud. So you want to make sure that there's no um, uh, purchases or recurring purchases that may come up on a credit card statement that are not part of that older adult's um, a monetary, uh, you know, regular regular life. There is, um, uh, there are many stories of um, some creeping costs that come in. For uh, example, it could be an, an Amazon, uh, uh, you know, cost for something that might be regular. It might be some other subscription service or something like that 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 person no longer uses, hasn't used for years, but is continuing to be charged on a credit card. Then compare expenses to income. Always add everything up, divide by 12, um, subtract the expenses and see where you are. Um, if the income doesn't meet those expenses, figure out ways to cut back or figure out um, and, and just take a, a closer look at exactly what the spending is. So, as I said, the budget is created not only for you, but also for the person that, oh, for whom you're caring.
uh, you want to put as much on autopilot as you can. Some of the bill paying, you know, things that you know, the utilities are one good example. You may have, uh, you know, uh, a television, Internet, phone, all of that stuff may be another one you can put on auto pay. Um, and most important above all, really, is to have direct deposit for any of the checks that come in, any any benefits that uh, the older person is receiving, uh, any uh Anything that comes in, if the absolute best way is to have it directly deposited. You can see it in the bank statements and uh, you can be assured that it, in fact, was deposited and not uh, lost in the mail somewhere or misdelivered. So what are the things that you can do as a caregiver for an older adult and kind of do it to your, for yourself on side as financial assistant, whether it's writing bills or monitoring accounts, managing investments or paying? It all escalates over time with aging. One of the things I did with my parents for a while was we'd sit down with all the bills. When I would see them, we would go through them. And one at a time, usually, sometimes my mother for a while, but then usually my father would, I would write out the check with the amount and he would sign it. And then I would show him the check with the amount and I would show him the bill that he received so that he knew that that matched. And my my dad, for whatever reasons, was not interested in computers, which is fine. But I needed to do that through paper copies that were available to him and through uh, and by using a checkbook. And so and the other thing is that caregivers are always saying that they can benefit from more financial advice. Uh, I think, you know, in general, we are not as financially literate as we could be. That's why I can't not recommend to you enough the Wiser website for continuing your financial education. Uh, it's in plain language, it's straightforward, and it really is um, about the best place I know, the easy place to go for fact sheets and other information about uh, financial, um, not only financial caregiving, but also uh, your financial decisions over the course of a lifetime. Uh, there are some states that have filial responsibility laws. I have not seen that very much, uh, you know, uh, enforced, but I think that there are, as this caregiving um, issue becomes more and more important and explodes, these laws may well be enforced. Another place it's good to look is the the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau also published uh, something called Managing Someone Else's Money. These are terrific guidebooks. They are wonderful to help you if you are uh, a financial caregiver in the sense that you have a power of attorney and you are trying to carry out the duties of managing somebody else's money, uh, an older adult's money, and you're trying to figure out if you can sign this or not sign this, if you can, uh, and how you can uh, take a look at how the expenses are coming in. It also gives some really good ideas about how to continue to protect that older adult from scams and frauds. Um, really important. The guides are in four different categories. The, the, it, they are those for agents under powers of attorney, court appointed guardians, trustees, and government fiduciaries. By government fiduciaries, they mean you know the rep payees, for example, that the uh, Veterans Administration uses. Rep pays are also used sometimes in, in state retirement systems, um, but they, they can come up in, in different circumstances. But the guide is very good uh, in outlining their duties and responsibilities. These are all available online. They're all free and you can and you can take out you can download one for yourself or you can have a whole bunch. Uh, they're at consumerfinance.gov, managing someone else's money. So it's your turn. You're the caregiver. You're overwhelmed. You've got all these things going on, but you can't forget to plan for your own retirement at the same time. So what are your sources of retirement income? Make sure you've got them listed. Probably Social Security, private or government pensions of whatever sort. IRAs, where are they? Where, or how much is in the account? Can they be combined? What, and what are your personal savings and your personal investments? Those are the four major sources of income. And what are you going to be your needs in retirement? Take a look. Experts recommend that you use 85% of you know, pre-tax income. I'm saying use 100 because 
the extra money that you may put aside or estimate for your needs in uh, retirement will come in handy no matter what. And calculate the gap if you have one between income and need, and most likely you will have one. So you have to figure out while you are still able to manage, uh, manage your money and think about what your needs would be in retirement to be able to continue to set aside money for that day when your, uh, your income may be decreased. Now, you have to figure out, so know what your retirement is going to cost. What is your number? Figure out how much income you will need in retirement. And even a best guess is better than nothing. And if you just say, I can't figure it out, just guess. Because I'm telling you, the most important thing is to have a number that you work with. There are lots of great tools and online calculators that make this very easy. And two of the best are from T. Rowe Price and Transamerica. They both have retirement calculators on their websites. Also, retireonyourownterms.org is another place to go. And Social Security has a very easy one to use at its, uh, its website, ssa.gov. Those are three very good ones and are four really good ones um, to be able to help you give some kind of rough number of what you will need. So um, I think this picture says it all. I mean, you sort of feel like you're on the couch and the weight of the world is upon you because you're about to think about retirement issues and it can seem like there's more um, more paralyzing things to think about than not. But it's not that hard when you start to break it down. First of all, make a list of your sources of income. What do you have coming in or what do you think you'll be coming in? Where's your bank account? Where are they? What's the financial company? Who are the people to contact? Making all those lists are really important, not only for you, but for your beneficiaries if they need that. Figure out how much is in the account now. What kind of an account is it? Is it an account that's going to grow over time or is it going to be static? I mean, right now, bank accounts are not, not growing very much. There's hardly anywhere to find money in a depository bank that's going to grow. But the investment investments can somehow uh, grow uh, faster and, and bigger, but there's also risk associated with them. So what are your contributions to those accounts and for how long and for how much? And can you continue to do those deposits during the course of your retirement? I mean, one of the things that I've really looked at is um, in, in trying to figure out, and I'm not there yet, but trying to figure out exactly what my budget would be in retirement is also figuring out a place where I can continue to save money. Where can I continue to put money in every month? So if you're not on track or you want some more information, one of the best places to go for an economic checkup is from the National Council of Aging Americans. Try the economiccheckup.org. It's a fantastic tool, and it shows you not only um, how to kind of put your um, your retirement together, but there's also something there for uh, a benefits checkup so that you may be eligible for other benefits that you haven't thought about, or you may be eligible upon retirement for some of those. Another place to look is the National Foundation for Credit Card Counseling. This is if you have to um, have some overwhelming bills that you need to figure out how to pay over time, especially either before before you retire, hopefully, but uh, even during retirement. So the largest expense in older age is medical. And I think we've all come to realize that um, if in our general life experience. Uh, I think the, the, the statistics is something like, you know, uh, 60 or 70 percent of your remaining wealth disappears in your last two or three years of life just because uh, people face so many challenges with uh, medical issues, with sometimes chronic conditions, uh, and sometimes other things can happen. Um, for example, my dad was very healthy, but he fell one night in the bathroom, smashed his head to smithereens, ended up in the trauma unit of the National Rehab Hospital for over a month with a, uh, with a traumatic brain injury because of, um, you know, sort of a massive uh, all hands on deck approach. My dad came back uh, probably nine months later, but it wasn't a great thing for him to do when he was 97 years old, but it did cost a lot of money. It was a huge time commitment and it was it really brought home to me anyway, a healthy man, no chronic conditions, one fall. And we were right into the major expense of health care. 
So where do you look to learn more about this? Medicare.gov. I know it's a daunting website, believe me. I've been there many times, but it's it's one of the still one of the best places to go uh, for extra help, especially for lower income seniors or people uh, who are looking at other types of financial issues. Uh, also take a look at Secure at SSA. The Social Security has a, a really good website. Uh, to be able to help you navigate what might be some of your questions having to do with uh, Medicare. And SHIP, which is the Senior Health Insurance Assistance Program, provides free counseling for Medicare beneficiaries and their families. It can assist you with applying for Medicare, Medicare savings programs, and and help you with extra help. Uh, It's at uh, SHIPTA Center, SHIPTechnicalAssistanceCenter.org. Uh, another really good uh, site, and also the the Medicare Rights Center. Um, Even in these times of pandemics, there are people there that are willing to help you, uh, especially if you are living on low or fixed incomes, to help screen programs that are going to help you pay the costs of Medicare. So what are some of the best places to go for uh, financial help for older Americans? Eldercare.gov. It's at acl.gov. This is a national service that connects older adults and their caregivers with local and trusted services. I cannot say enough about this. Not everybody knows about it. Share this information with everybody you know, eldercare at acl.gov. It will help you find the, the, the services that you need. It can be home and community-based services for an older adult who doesn't want to leave home but still needs care. It can help you with food service if you have someone who who needs uh, Meals on Wheels or other continuing services for food. It also helps with Medicare, Medicaid. It also can help you probably locate services for an older adult who can um, pick someone up and get them to doctor's appointments, get them home. There's also a piece there which will take uh, veterans to VA hospitals for appointments. There's all kinds of information available there at eldercare.gov. And the other place is the benefit checkup. That's another place you look and can help you uh, find programs that will pay for medication, pay for health care, food, or utilities. Uh, if you have a, an older adult for whom you're caring, or you want to know, there is a securities helpline for seniors at the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. And that is somebody who may feel like uh, the broker keeps uh, trading things in the account so that the broker gets the, the benefit of the trade, but that the securities uh, portfolio is not increasing or they feel like they've been taken advantage of in some way or some other issue. But the FINRA hotline has also been very effective. Okay, I made every one of these mistakes, so I'm gonna share them with you. One is not seeking advice and planning before the crisis clouds may, are, are there. Um, I talked to my parents at one point and I said to them, well, so what's the plan? And they were like, well, I don't know. I said. Well, we, we can't wait until we have to have a plan to make a plan. So the plan was, this is okay until it isn't. And that's not a really good plan. So I would recommend that you think about these issues, even though they may be difficult, as you plan ahead. Not evaluating and engaging other people to be part of that caregiving is also something that you should continue to, don't do this. I mean, evaluate, talk to people, ask everybody you know. Be surprised, information can come from all kinds of sources. Another thing is make sure you do talk with family members about the financial roles and expectations of everyone so that the caregivers know what is expected of them and what is available to them. And don't pay for everything when you can't afford it. I just um, <laughs> don't do that, but I, I think there's a you know also a good idea to pay for some things when you can, but certainly not everything. And also probably the most important is don't forget, you may be the person who ends up living on your own someday. So plan for that as well. Even though you may have um, a devoted spouse or partner, make sure that you always plan for the moment that you may be alone. Statistically, that's going to be, uh, that's more likely than not. And saving less for retirement because you're helping someone else isn't going to help you when you realize that you're living on your own. Another thing we're going to talk about for a little bit here is care agreements for families and caregivers. These are extremely helpful. So what do those care agreements look like? Well, they can take any form you want, and but they are really to assure that if you have a family member who is the caregiver, 
that there is money uh, from the recipient to the caregiver that is allocated for that so that the payments can be made out of, of those or you can have siblings who contribute to to the uh, to the payment of the caregiver in some way. It, if you have an agreement, it helps avoid family conflicts or down the line. It can also figure out what you're going to be paid. And you should discuss it with everybody to resolve any concerns before it's drafted. And for Medicaid payments purposes, rather, it can show that the care payments that were made were legitimate and they were not an attempt to hide assets. Medicaid is very good about clawing back their, uh, their benefits if they feel like there has been an attempt to hide assets. I have seen these agreements work very well. They work because people in the family talk to one another and because someone is de uh, designated to be the caregiver, often, as I say, the dutiful daughter who is the caregiver, that person also needs compensation because there will be other uh, economic consequences to that person, as we've seen, uh, as they take on this task. It should cover things like when is the care going to begin, the specific care that the caregiver will provide, how often and for how long that care will last, and the payment and the amount of times of payment to the caregiver. How long the personal care agreement is in effect is another thing to discuss. And a statement that allows changes only through the agreement of the caregiver and the care recipient. I think that you might also include some other family member in that if you have a family that's participating in that. Uh, one of my good friends who is a postal inspector had a sister who was taking care of her mother, um, you know, a thousand miles away from everybody else in the family. And she said, oh, no, no, I'll just take care of mom. It doesn't matter. I'll, I'll be fine. fine." But instead, they decided to get together to create a care agreement. So her sister, who was taking care of her mother, received every two weeks uh, some small payment from the other brothers and sisters so that at least she was compensated for um, for gas for her car, for her mileage, for maybe some other uh, some other issues that they could show were, were related to her mother's care. It made a huge difference. This woman was living on a very low income that she did not reveal to the family. So this money really made a difference for her. So where can you find these agreements? Well, there are some on the Wiser website, wiserwomen.org. There are additional resources that have them. One is the National Association of Elder Law Attorneys, or NALA. Uh, also, the Caregiving uh, Family Caregiver Alliance at caregiver.org has a few that you could use, too. Also look for a long-term care personal support services agreement uh, that has been uh, put out by uh, the Department of Health and Human Services um, to take a look and see if that works for you too. But uh, another a good example to go to is the state of Maine, which has been really in the forefront of much of this, uh, also has a bunch. So if you go to the um, maine.gov and you look for care agreements, you should be able to find something. Uh, and that is listed here as well. So here are some other resources and tools. Caregiver Action Network is a good place. Caregiving.com. This will help you find assisted living facilities, housing arrangements, elder law attorneys, geriatric care managers, and online support groups. I can also tell you I used uh, a branch of caring.com as I was caring for my parents because they set up the payment system for uh, my father's caregivers for the last two years of his life so that the paychecks to the caregivers were deposited directly into their bank account. All of the correct taxes were taken out. Um, all of my unemployment insurance uh, taxes were taken out. I didn't have to do anything. I just had to make sure there was enough money in the account for that. But I can tell you just having not having to deal with that and having to only focus on my father's health was a huge help to me. And also the caregivers really liked having the, the direct deposit into their account. And it saved a lot of time, effort, and agony when it came time to file uh, taxes. Another place to look is lots of helping hands, which also will, you know, create, helps you create your own uh, uh, site to uh, support your own family. So you can make your, your, own, uh, your own arrangements there and use it for your entire extended family. AARP also has pretty good caregiving uh, resources, as does Help Our Wounded, how, uh, another one for wounded uh, veterans and caregivers of wounded veterans, and the Well Spouse Association uh, as well. So those are some places to look. Another place that, and I think an important conversation to have, maybe with yourself about yourself and also with other members of your family, are what are your end-of-life planning? 
What are the kinds of things that you are you want to have? What are the palliative care you want to have? Do you want to be in hospice? What kinds of uh, things do you want to have that go along with uh, a, a DNR, if that's what you choose to have? Compassion and Choices is one place to look. That's CompassionandChoices.org, the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, another. The Conversation Project is probably one of my favorites. The Conversation Project was started by a woman journalist in Boston because uh, the issues in her family became so complicated, nobody wanted to talk about them. It gives you all kinds of guides to having family conversations about difficult subjects, particularly the subject of uh, extended care for older adults and also end-of-life planning. It's terrific. Uh, that's the conversationproject.org. And also fivewishes.org is another one, which is a more holistic approach to uh, legal uh, living wills. It continues. It talks about an individual's care and comfort choices, all critical issues. So there's lots of wiser uh, resources. I can't tell you enough. There's, there are um, so many good fact sheets there. One is about the Savers Credit. Please, if you download nothing else or take a look at nothing else, go to wiserwomen.org. Look at the fact sheets available and look at the savers credit. There is a, oh, it's a fantastic advice for, for uh, moderate income families to be able to continue to save for retirement. And I just want you to let you know also that Wiser is about to uh, install, or I think has installed, the, um, a caregiving portal on its website at wiserwomen.org which will then consolidate this information that I've been talking to today, talking about today. It is a one-stop shop that should give you what you need so you don't have to go bouncing around all over the place looking for things. You can just go one place. And we want to be able to help family caregivers uh, understanding the impact of, of caregiving and on their own financial security and provide resources and to tools to help the caregivers to oversee their financial caregiving and the tasks of caring for another adult. So um, we, uh, we're we hoping that this will be an extensive library of continuing of uh, more educational materials focused on caregiving. And we're also hoping to have some new uh, content, content as it becomes available as podcasts and videos. Um, and it does have a comprehensive list of community-based programs with fact sheets and tip sheets. I, I can't say enough. Thank you for having me so much today. I'm eager to hear what your questions might be. Uh, there is a wealth of information there. But again, I keep saying, please, please, please think with your head before you leap with your heart. It's so difficult. I have been in your shoes. I know what this is like. I know how many years I have done it. And as an only child, I've done much of it alone. So if you can continue to have more, uh, input from friends and family, contacting ger geriatric caregivers, being able to think about your own financial work, your own financial um, life at the same time you're caring for someone else will be the best gift that you can give yourself. So thank you. I hope you look up wiser. I hope you join the, the, um, the newsletter and I, I hope you've learned something good today. Thank you. <laughs>